the city? How are you guys doing? Ready for school to start? I, as a mom of three small children, am very ready for school to start. We've enjoyed the summer, but we're ready for some kind of routine again. Are you ready to worship this morning? Would you stand with us? Father God, we uh, are excited to come into your presence this morning, Jesus. God, we just want to lift your name high this morning. Would you be in this room, in our hearts, in our praise, Father? This is all for you. And we lift your name, Father.
Cause you stepped into my Egypt You took me by the hand You marched me out in freedom Into the promised land Now I will not forget you God I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fury of We're here to praise God. Amen. We read in Psalms, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall put forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Father God, we want to make known your glorious deeds. God, your might, your power, your greatness. Father God, if all we ever do is praise you, it will be a life well lived. We love you, Lord, and we worship you.
of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and than just a song that we sing. May it be the posture of our hearts, Father. May it be the evidence of our faith, our trust in you. God, we don't have to know what's going to happen tomorrow because we know the one who holds tomorrow. Father, may we trust in you.
I'm still in your hands. This is the confidence. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Do you believe that phrase? Then with that, let's pray. Lord, we are in your hands. As the body of Christ, as your people, we trust you. We have confidence in who you are. We have confidence in what your presence brings us. And this morning, we worship you. We give thanks for your presence. We give thanks for your spirit. And we worship you. You are God. Be exalted in this room. Be exalted in our hearts. Be exalted in our city, our state, the nation, And in this world, Lord, there are needs. The world that you created and the world that your scripture says you love so much that you sent Jesus. There are big things happening. Lord, I pray for right now the people of Afghanistan. What's happening? Jesus, I pray for the church in Afghanistan. I pray for your people, to be able to minister, to serve. Lord, I pray for protection. The place is once again 
become a battle zone. And I just pray, God, for peace. I pray for whatever conditions you desire so that a move of your spirit can happen and that people can be drawn to you through Jesus Christ. That's our hunger. That's our desire for this planet. Lord, I pray for people in Haiti. Incredible earthquake. Hundreds killed. Thousands injured. Jesus, I just ask again for your church to be able to rise up and serve and minister and support. Lord, our hearts break with these kind of things, and we just ask for your miraculous touch. And Lord, our nation, our nation is so broken and divided. We ask for a healing move of your Holy Spirit to move throughout this nation. So angry, so locked up, so much fear. Lord, I pray against fear in the name of Jesus. Your perfect love casts out all fear. We're making rash decisions. We're attacking each other. We're divided over fear. And I just ask in the name of Jesus that your church would lead the way in letting your perfect love cast out all fear. Letting the confidence that we're in your hands, that you've never failed us, let us be the people who walk without fear. We worship you. I pray for everyone in this room. I pray for everyone on the line, the radio, wherever people are listening. I just ask, Lord, that there would be such a sense of your presence right now and that we would trust you whether it's financial needs, family needs, marriage, whatever it is, Jesus, I pray that we would trust you and that we would see your move. Lord, as we continue in our service, I pray that you would lead us and guide us and that the worship wouldn't stop because the music stopped. I pray that we would worship you as we listen to your word, as we process, and as we learn to hear your voice. We thank you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isn't he good? The Lord is good. Okay, before you're seated, some of you already jumped the gun, and I am sorry. Man, one of the beauty, beautiful things about being together is that we get to be with the body of Christ. So take a moment, say hi to someone, let them know you're glad they're here, and just greet one another. Thanks, you guys. Hi, I'm Jamie McGuire, pastor of our Next Gen Ministries. And I'm Tiffany Cowan, the coordinator for our growth ministries. In our jobs, we get to work with families. And here's some questions about family life that we hear a lot. How do we lead our kids to Jesus when we feel like we're just meeting him ourselves? How do I ask for help when I'm not used to asking for help? What parts of the Bible do I know well enough to teach to somebody else? How do I, as I'm raising a teenager, figure out what's okay to let her watch or what's okay to let her listen to? How do I lead my voice to Christ as a single father? How do I answer those questions and challenges that our world has in a godly way? Family, it's the most foundational unit in our faith. And here at River City, we wanna help you answer some of these questions and build a more solid foundation for you and your family. We want to challenge you to do family on purpose. Leading a family and parenting is hard, and it's okay to get help. In fact, it's really imperative that you do. If your marriage is stuck, come to re-engage, or if you struggle with your kid's behavior, join us in our parenting classes. You can be the person who teaches your child the Bible, and we can help. You don't have to be perfect to lead your family. You just have to be obedient, and willing and surrendered to him and his will. Join us for marriage and parenting classes. Bring your kids and teens to our Wednesday night program and maybe even stay a while so that you can learn how to better lead your kids to Christ. Or sign up for one of our specialty classes like single and parenting or apologetics, worldview and family finances that can help deepen your faith and address these challenges in family life. You know, you can pick one night or two or all of them to better equip yourself for family on purpose. Sign up today. That's some good stuff right there.
You know what I'm saying? I mean, really, when you talk about discipleship begins in the home. So let us support you. Let us encourage you in that. You'll hear more about that. We're actually going to talk about it in a couple weeks. So uh, we just want to encourage every family to take advantage of that and to begin the process of growing. Well, it's good to see you all. You doing all right? <clears throat> I'm <just> talking. <laughs> hey, I want to just say to all who are listening, it's time to get back to church. Now, you would say, but Sean, we're right here in church. Yeah, but there's people right now who are online, and we love that you're online. We love having you with us, but there is something that happens when the body gathers. That really, I, I, it was, it, I think it was last week in worship, I just sensed, man, I want everybody to experience this. There's something about that face-to-face, and I know we've just been through a pandemic, and I know there's all kinds of news and all kinds of things that is, are, are scary and alarming, and I just want to encourage you, do the things you need to do to protect your family, but get back living your life. Get back living the life God created you for. And one of the things I want to encourage you in is the gathering of the body of Christ is one of those essential things. It truly is. It's not the same. Listening to a sermon on a CD, watching a service on TV, watching online is great. It's a great kind of bridge. It's a great thing to enjoy when you can't be there. But there is something that happens in the spirit when the body of Christ gathers together. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there. Now you're like, well, wait a minute, we're filled with the Spirit, he's with us, right? But there's something unique. He said that because there's something unique that happens when we gather. So I want to encourage you. I really do. I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're watching this, you're like, man, I don't know if it's safe. Hey, I, I, I honestly believe what's not safe, it is not safe for a follower of Jesus Christ to not gather with the body of Christ. That's not safe. And so I, what I want to do is, is I want us to begin to just encourage one another in this. Okay, I'll be talking a little bit more about it. Beginning a special teaching series on September 5th. On September 5th. And it's going to take us all the way through the fall. And, and it's called Ephesians. Ephesians, God's plan for God's people in God's world. This is one of the coolest books in the Bible. And it's like, well, they're all cool because they're inspired by God, right? When it's God-breathed, it has really an advantage over anything else, Okay. But the book of Ephesians, something about when Paul wrote this book, there's just this huge sweeping vision, God's grand vision for the world. And so God's plan for God's people in God's world, that's the book of Ephesians. And we're just going to walk through it. And there's so many cool things. You want, you want teaching on family life? Ephesians has got it. You want teaching on the gifts of the Spirit and on the spiritual journey? Ephesians has got it. You want to know how the church should be with one another? Ephesians has got it. You want to know our mission out into the context of the world? Ephesians has got it. And so we are going to walk through this book of the Bible. And we're just going to take our time. You know, there's going to be some good stuff. So I just want to encourage you. This is a great opportunity. Fall is a great opportunity Come on back. Encourage people in your groups. Encourage people in your neighborhoods. We're going to be encouraging this whole body. It's time for us to say, okay, we're going to trust the Lord, and we're going to move together. And again, I just want want to encourage you. If you're like, yeah, but I'm afraid. It might not be safe for my health. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. I encourage you to take the necessary precautions, but don't let fear steal your life, because life is made up of days. And we're on our second year of giving up to fear. Okay, second year. You only got so many of those. We don't have that many. Don't give them up to fear. Take appropriate precautions. Be wise. Be smart. But then, let's live the life God gave us to live. And let's do that together. So, September 5th, we're going to begin this incredible series called Ephesians. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. And we'll see what the Lord does. Now this morning, I, I want to wrap up just a little mini-series we've done, a little conversation called listening. Listening, and we're talking about listening in prayer. Remember what we said, we started out with a premise. We said, of all the important reasons to pray, and there are many, of all the important reasons to pray, the most important one is to listen, is to listen. We spend a lot of time talking, and we think the important thing is what we say, and, and they, those are important things. It's important to express ourselves. It's important to bring our needs, to intercede for others. But when you understand that God wants to speak to us, and we have an opportunity to hear from the creator, 
the most important thing that happens in, pr in prayer is not what I say, it's what I hear. Remember, we talked about having a listening heart, a listening head, and developing a listening habit. And then we discovered, and I think we all recognize, sometimes the most challenging part of listening is learning to quiet the noise. Learning to quiet the noise. We live in a noisy world. In fact, our pace has caused us to be noisy people. I'm not talking about decibels here. I'm talking about just our pace and the stuff going through our heads and how long it takes us to relax. We talked about the disciplines of solitude, silence, and surrender to make space and be able to hear the voice of the Lord. And then last week, we said, if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to know his voice. Because there's all kinds of people. Remember the T-shirt I had? I got a lot of comments on that T-shirt, by the way. I wish I would have kind of had some for sale because we, we could have done really well. Remember just this kind of old-timey classical picture of Jesus with his hand up, kind of, and, you know, the Jesus look, you know, and saying, I never said that. And the idea is, man, there's all kinds of people saying, oh, Jesus said, Jesus said, like, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, have you ever even heard of Jesus? Have you ever read the scripture? Have you ever heard what Jesus actually said? I don't think he said what you just said. We had to learn to recognize his voice because there's all kinds of other voices. And we, we learned how to distinguish his voice. We learned how he speaks, ways he speaks. This week I want to deal with a question. And I just want you to be honest. Because one of the things, if I ask people, you know, how's your prayer life, I get almost always the same answer. And it's, well, it could be better. The safe, non-committal answer. How's your prayer life? Well, it could be better. So would you say it's like really terrible? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. But it could be better. Would you say it's great? No, I wouldn't say that. No, no. Eh, not there, not there, no. And let me, let me ask you a question. Is there ever a time where you, you, you would say, or you feel like your prayer life is boring or lifeless? Don't have to raise your hand, because I think if you raise your hand, you would be struck by lightning immediately, so. <laughs> okay, obviously I don't think that, but I think some of us do. No, I could never say that. God might hear me. It's like saying I don't like going to my mother-in-law's house or something. I can't do that. Yeah, you got to understand, God is never afraid of our honest questions, our honest inquiries, our honest expressions. But I think a lot of us sometimes find our prayer life to be lifeless and boring. And it's like when you understand that, wait a minute, prayer is communication with God, that, and you hear all the promises about prayer, and you hear what God does in prayer, and you hear the, just the amazing things God has done in prayer, or you sit for five minutes with someone who truly has understood prayer and has experienced the power of prayer. It's like, how can something that the Bible talks so powerfully about and that people have seen their lives changed by, how can it be boring and lifeless? And I want to suggest there's one primary element that we're missing. If you have found your prayer life to be boring or lifeless, then I, I believe the Lord's got something for us in this morning's message that could absolutely turn that around for you. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Because I think it's how we view prayer. It's not supposed to be boring. It's, it is our lifeline with him. It is our communication with Father. But I think what we're about to see in the Word of God can transform how you view prayer. Let's begin at verse 9, Romans chapter 8, one of the great passages in Paul's letter to Rome, uh, to the Romans. He says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but if in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Let me br bring out a couple obvious points in there. This is talking about, very directly, about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We understand that when we become followers of Jesus Christ, his spirit comes to dwell in us. Some people talk about, well, no, 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 there's a second experience. 
and I had a chance, you, you, got, you guys who are, this is your church home, you know I wrote a book on this called The Pilgrim's Guide to the Spirit-Filled Life. And one of the things I pointed out is, is, is it a one-time experience or is, it a, is there a second experience? And I said, I think they're both kind of right and both kind of wrong. Because if you look in the scripture, it says in Acts chapter two, they were all filled with the Spirit. Then the, some of the same people were in Acts chapter four, they were praying and they were all filled with the Spirit. And you see multiple instances where it says they were filled with the Spirit. But Paul here makes very clear Okay, he says, if you don't have the spirit, you don't belong to him. So you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, are filled with his spirit. And he says, if you're in Christ, his spirit dwells in you. And he uses the phrase, and I love this phrase, gives life to your mortal bodies. So because some people go, well, that's just a metaphorical idea, and you know, his spirit is around us. And so no, no, he says it gives life to your mortal bodies. 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. So as much as our spirit is in us, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our lives, his spirit interacts with our spirit and gives life to our mortal bodies. And our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that, when you understand this idea, I was talking with some friends about this subject, and, and I was trying to help, help understand this idea that, you know, we all, oh, God is in me. I understand God is in me. I'm a Christian. God is in me. But when I said, you know that's, me, that's the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's how God is in you. And it was like a light bulb came on. It was like they hadn't made that connection. It was the Holy Spirit. That was one of those things that we kind of avoid, and oh, man, I don't want to get off into the real weird circle. Ooh, you know, I don't want to go there. You've got to make ghost noises when you talk about that kind of thing. It's important. Guests are going, does he always do that? Yes, yes, I do. But it's like people avoid it because, yeah, some people have gone overboard. Some people have maybe overemphasized some things or underemphasized others. That's fine. I don't base my faith on the abuses of other people. We base it on the word of God. And it talks about this amazing gift. In fact, the whole reason for the cross, the reason for the cross was so that our sin could be forgiven, so we could be set free, so we could experience what God created us for, the indwelling of his spirit. Told you before, the point of our faith is not the cross. The cross is the essential doorway through which we must all go so that we can be forgiven and set free, so God's spirit can dwell with us and we can live the life we were created for that sin has stolen from us. And this is an absolute game changer, the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You understand, he, the, we, we use this phrase in theology called regeneration. In other words, my spirit, which was dead because of sin and could in no way save itself, is brought to life because of his spirit, and I'm made alive in him. Isn't that amazing? It's like an absolute change. If you have a new nature, you're not the same. That's important. You're not, just a, you're not just the same person now with a new set of rules trying to do better this time. You have a different spirit. Your spirit has been made alive by his spirit, which now also dwells in you in, in fellowships with your spirit. You have a new nature. You're different. Scripture talks about the fruit of the spirit. Do you understand what he does in your life? I love that word fruit because it's the produce. It's what he produces in your life. People talk about the, the evidence of being filled with the Spirit. You know, I, I grew up in Pentecostal circles, and the evidence was speaking in tongues. Well, as I grew up in the Word, I saw, I, it never really says that. It plainly says what the evidence or the fruit of being filled with the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That list is pretty amazing when you think about it. He's working that in you. You need love? Good. The Holy Spirit is working that in you. Joy, peace, patience? Good. He, that's what his spirit is producing in your life as you submit to his leadership and partner with his work and let him lead. He's producing the fruit of the spirit in you. How about the gifts of the spirit? There's all kinds of powerful gifts. You read 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to be looking at Ephesians 4. They talk about gifts. Romans 12 talks about gifts. Gifts of the spirit, unique things that you can't do apart from the Holy Spirit, but that he has empowered the believers to do differently. We don't all have the same gifts, but we all have gifts of the Spirit, the Scripture tells us. Guidance. The Holy Spirit is with you to lead and to guide. How about power? 
Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses, my representatives, the people who tell my story because of what they've experienced. This indwelling thing is pretty powerful, and that's what the Christian life is about. Now skip down to verse 26, because this is so important. He says, likewise, and this is key, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness, and then he defines that weakness for us. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. For the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gift of your Spirit. Help us to hear and help us to let you lead today. In Jesus' name, amen. We do not know what to pray for as we ought. Sounds like Paul might have even at times felt like his prayer life was a little bit lifeless or boring or meandering, rambling. But he says, no, 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 because of the Spirit, it doesn't have to be that way. He says, we don't know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, I want to suggest this right here is a key is the key to a vibrant prayer life. You have a prayer partner, and if you are not engaging your prayer partner, you're missing out. And some of you have a person who's a prayer partner. That's awesome. They're your go-to. When something's going on in your life, ask them to pray for you. When you get together and you pray with this person, that is a, an amazing and a helpful habit and an, a helpful relationship to have, a person that you trust to pray with you. That's a great, great thing but it pales in comparison to the prayer partner that God gave you when you became a follower of Jesus Christ that sadly, we too often ignore in our prayer life. We treat it like it's just us. When instead, he's saying, no, 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 you have a prayer partner who wants to intercede for you and with you according to the will of God. If you're taking notes, here's the main point. Write this down. One of the best ways to grow in listening is to engage your prayer partner, the Holy Spirit. One of the best ways to grow in listening is to engage your prayer partner, the Holy Spirit. See, what I'm saying here is I, I, I want to suggest one of the reasons prayer can seem so lifeless and lacking is we treat it like a one-sided monologue. We just go and we talk, 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 instead of truly letting the Spirit pray in us, with us, through us. He's more than just a tutor who teaches us how to pray. He's a partner who prays with us. And that really brings us to kind of the key question, how do we see prayer? Do we see prayer as our list of needs? Or do we see it as a time to engage with the Spirit? Do we see it as a time to enter into relational communion? with our eternal creator through his Holy Spirit who he said dwells in us. Because that changes it, doesn't it? That is a very different proposition than, well, Lord, I'm going to say my list again because I said I'd pray about these things and I prayed about them yesterday. I haven't seen any change yet, so I'm going to pray about them today. And please do not misinterpret. I'm not saying you shouldn't have the list. You should. He invites us to bring our needs before him. And that's a good thing. But if that's all it is, it can get boring. Whereas when you begin to say, wait a minute, I'm not alone here. And God has placed his presence, his spirit in me to, to pray with me. One of the best ways to grow in listening is to engage your prayer partner. Now, let me give you a few ways how to engage your prayer partner. Okay, the first one, learn to pray in the spirit. Learn to pray in the Spirit. And you're like, well, okay, Sean, I'll just go do that, and I'll come back next week, and it'll be better. But what I, what I think is interesting is we often think pray to the Spirit. The Scripture in multiple occasions says to pray in the Spirit, and that's different. Ephesians 6.18 says praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. We should pray for one another. We should pray for our needs. But praying in the Spirit is something different. 
Jude, verse 20 and 21 says, but you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. What does it mean to be praying in the Spirit? You know, as I thought about that, I thought, okay, what would be the opposite? Because sometimes if you're trying to figure out, okay, what's the opposite? Well, praying in the flesh. Remember in James 4, he said, you know, you pray and you don't receive because you ask amiss. You pray so you can spend it on your own passions instead of praying according to the will of God. So praying in the flesh would just be it's all about me. It's all about me. God, what I want, what I need, here's what I want you to do. Praying in the Spirit is saying, no, 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 God, I, I want to invite you to pray. I want to partner with you in this understanding of prayer. It's him praying with me. The Holy Spirit joining with me, leading, guiding, praying with me. Him praying through me. Him praying through me. Now, there is such a thing called the gift of tongues in the Scripture, and the idea is that there is a possibility of a prayer language. And again, I, I'm careful here because some people have taken this so far and have gone places that I don't think the Scripture leads us to make this some central preeminent gift. But in 1 Corinthians 14, there's this implication that there is a way to pray in the Spirit, in this gift of tongues that might be available for every believer. I'm not going to take, you know, that's not a hill I'm going to die on. But that there's this idea that the Spirit could pray through me. And what Paul just said there is he intercedes, he prays for me. This, the Holy Spirit of God praying with me, praying through me, and praying for me. That is a, that is a game changer. This idea of saying, I'm not alone in this, I'm not the one who just has to kind of make this thing happen. It's not all about me. Lord, I invite you by your Holy Spirit in me to now pray with me. I invite you to lead me in prayer. Praying in the Spirit is a very different proposition. And I want to suggest it's one of those things that can change your life. You don't have to go do anything different as far as, I don't have to go get anything I don't have. You are filled with the Spirit. You have everything you need to pray in the Spirit. Just having to understand that this is a different approach and okay, I'm going to, instead of just praying to the Spirit, I am going to pray in the Spirit. One of the best ways to grow in listening is to engage your prayer partner, the Holy Spirit. A second thing as we engage our prayer partner that I think is important, we should expect his prayers to be different than ours. Expect his prayers to be different than yours. Because listen to 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 16. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? Okay, so he's just making an obvious Right? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Are you following me on this? Because it's really important. He's setting this up well. Nobody knows really the mind of a person except the spirit of that person within them. He's just making that as an obvious illustration. He says, in the same way, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And that's the Spirit that we've received. Not a Spirit from the world, but the Spirit from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart these in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And now he says something very plain here. He says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discern the spirit person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one for who has understood the mind of the lord so as to instruct him but we have the mind of christ 
Now, verse 14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Have, have you ever shared really spiritual things God is saying to you with your family members maybe or neighbors or coworkers who absolutely don't believe in Jesus, they're not followers, they don't pretend to be, and, and had them look at you like you were crazy? You see, here's the thing. I think we should expect that. Paul just said they cannot understand that. You're asking them to accept that you are following a spirit they can't see, hearing a voice they can't hear, and doing things that they just would never do. And quite honestly, if you're really candid, some of these things you would never do. And then we're surprised that they think we're a little out there. Folks, we're listening to the Spirit of God. We are following the Holy Spirit. We are a little bit out there. That's where we're supposed to be. That's what it means to be living a spirit-filled or a supernatural life. So that's, it, you just need to understand that. Don't get your feelings hurt. You know, when, you're, when your family members just don't get it, when your neighbors don't get it or coworkers, they don't get it. When you say, you know, I prayed about this, and I know that would seem to be the common sense thing to do, but I really feel like God wants me to do this instead, and they look at you like, you are out of your mind. I've actually told people before, I, I know it feels like that really, but this is what I think God wants me to do, so I trust him and we'll see what happens. And I've seen him do some crazy cool things through those moments when not only do my unsaved family members, friends, and people around me, not, they don't understand, I don't understand. Like, Lord, this other path is so much easier. Why wouldn't you just let me take that? And you know what's funny? He doesn't ever explain his will perfectly to me all in that moment. Oh, Sean, I'm sorry, you have a problem? Well, let me explain fully all my motives. It doesn't really work that way. What he does say is, I love you, and I want you to trust me, because I want to show you something. And Paul said that, man, that last phrase, we have the spirit, spirit knows God. And he says, we've understood the mind of the Lord, so or who has understood the mind of the Lord, so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so as you begin this partnership with the Spirit, and you begin to pray with your prayer partner, you have to understand a couple things. Number one, his priorities will not be the same as yours. And this is really tough, because it's funny, when you're praying and the Holy Spirit says, I want you to pray differently than what you want to pray, but it's my prayer. I mean, can't I pray what I want? And the Holy Spirit's like, oh, I thought I was your prayer partner. I thought I was the one to, to lead and teach you how to pray because you don't know how to pray. Well, <laughs> I suppose. Yes, yes, of course, technically. But this is what I want. You have to expect that his priorities will not be the same. And this is, this is sometimes tough. You start praying for one thing, and when you really say, I'm going to follow and I'm going to allow the Spirit to lead, it's like all of a sudden the thing that was high priority to you gets pushed to the back burner. And, and what keeps coming forward is something totally different. And it's a different priority. And all of a sudden you say, oh, his priority's different. Not that what I wanted to pray for was unimportant, it just wasn't the most important. And he brings something else. And I'm telling you, when that stuff starts to happen, that's when you're growing. That's when you are growing in the things of the Spirit because he is revealing the mind of Christ to you on the priorities, what's important. I mean, even in, you know, when you stop and think about it, even as we, we pray for other people and things, oh, Lord, help them to leave that bad habit behind. And God's like, yeah, that bad habit's a bummer, but what, what's, what's really killing them is their lack of trust in me. Pray that they would have faith. Pray that they would trust me. Pray that they would let go of the hurt and the bitterness and trust me to lead. And we were praying over their addiction or over a, a habit that they have that we find offensive. It's not that addiction isn't bad. It's not that the habit isn't hurtful. It's just, it's not the top priority. It's a symptom of something deeper, and he knows what's going on. His priorities are different than ours. And here's, uh, here's a really hard one. His desired outcome will not be the same as yours. What is it when, you, how, how do you like it when you're gonna pray about something? And you want your kid to do something. God, God, they need to make this decision. You begin to pray and God says, I want you to pray that they'll make the exact opposite decision. What?
I know the plans I have for them, plans to prosper them, not to harm them, plans to give them a hope and a future. And, and you don't know the plans I have for them. I know you love them. I know they're your children, but they're my children, aren't they? And at baby dedication, you said you understood that I was entrusting to them and you're a steward. <laughs> By the way, sign up for baby dedication today at River City Community Church. <laughs> But it's like, well, yeah, that was cool, the baby dedication thing, and the music was so nice, and they were dressed so cute and all. But you meant that? You really, like Hannah, want me to give my child into your hands and trust you with them. And so I'm praying for a desired outcome. My desired outcome, God, I pray that they'll choose this school because it's such a great school and it'll make everything so great. And God's like, I got a different school for them. Or I got a different path I want them to walk. And he begins to lead you to pray for them differently because not only are his priorities different than ours, his desired outcome is different than ours. That's tough. And that's why prayer is such an incredible faith builder. Because man, as we pray that and as we see God do those things and as we see the fruit that comes, our faith is built and we learn the best things that happen in prayer is when God redirects. That's not an unpleasant intervention. That's an unplanned surprise that's going to lead to something beautiful. And his focus will not be the same. His focus, his priorities won't be the same. His desired outcome won't be the same. His focus in prayer won't be the same as ours. That's why in the Lord's Prayer we're told to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes our prayer we implied is, Lord, my will be done. And if I say it enough, I know you're going to do what I want. His focus will not be the same. And here's a big one for us. See, so often when we pray, we want him to change the things around us when he wants to change us. We want him to change that other person. We want him to change the circumstance at work. We want him to change the, the circumstance in our country or the things that people are doing. Or Man, God, those people on the left or those people on the right. God, if you would change them, everything would be good. And God goes, right now, I want to focus on changing you. And by the way, you're the only person who you can really be involved in changing. I can't change someone else. I can help encourage, lead them to the Lord, facilitate what God's doing, help, but I can't change them. The only person I can change is me. And his focus is more often than not changing my vision, my perspective, my level of obedience and surrender. But in my prayers, it's often, God, I want you to do A, B, and C. He gives us in prayer the mind of Christ and our partnered prayers. This is so great. They will have a different power. As we begin to walk in this, as we begin to pray differently because of our partnership with him, our prayers will have a different power. I told you before, it's one of my favorite verses regarding prayer, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You know how many times we have scratched out the words according to his will? That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we, we know he hears us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we asked of him. This is, this, is to, this is a total different perspective for many of us. It's this idea that when I come to, prayer, to pray, he wants to change me and align me with his will so that at the start of prayer, I might be thinking we're going to pray about this, this, and this. At, by the end, it's like totally different. It's like, wow, God, I didn't see that coming. God's like, I know, that's why I'm God. And you're cool. You don't have to try to be God today either. You weren't yesterday. You're not going to be today. And it really is this sense of, oh, he is revealing what he's doing. The privilege of being a part and being privy to the things that God wants to do and praying according to his will. And here's the thing. If you're like, but I don't know God's will, and he told me to pray, so I'm going to ask. That's absolutely fine. But when we understand we have a prayer partner, there should always be this sense of God how, how, how are we doing on this? What do you want to see happen? 
aligning with him in prayer rather than trying to get him over on your team. I told you before, uh, one of the most damaging prayers we can pray, and it's sadly one of the most common pl- prayers we play, is God bless my plan. I have a great plan, God. Would you come and bless my plan? When if we believe Jesus, what we should be pl- praying is, God, give me your plan and let me be a part of your plan. And that's what I'm going to pray for. And there's power in that, because not only does it change circumstances, but it changes me. One of the best ways to grow in listening is to engage your prayer partner, the Holy Spirit. And last thing, practice listening by letting him lead in prayer, okay? Practice listening by letting him lead in prayer. Okay, you're like, well, we've been talking about that. Well, I want to tell you uh, how to do that, give you some tips on how to actually let him lead in prayer, okay? Five real simple things. You might want to jot these down, okay? Number one, admit that you don't know how to pray in each situation. That's what Paul said in Romans 8, 26, just admit it. Come to the table saying, God, I don't really know how to pray. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes we really, it's a tough situation, and we go, God, I'm not sure how to pray. That's a good place to be. But even in those things that we go, oh, I think I got it covered, God. Admit, God, I don't know how to pray in every situation. Number two, since you don't know how you should pray, ask him to lead. Invite him to lead. Since we understand biblically, number one, even the Apostle Paul admits it, So we should probably follow suit. I don't know how I should pray in every situation. Since I don't know how to pray, Lord, I invite you to lead in this prayer time. I ask you to lead. Number three, since you don't know what to pray for, let him lead you in making the list. Let him set the agenda for prayer. I mean, I I feel like it it was interesting. Early on, I figured out, okay, I need to pray that he would lead me in how to pray for these things. But it was kind of something new when it was like this idea of, oh, wait a minute. Let him help me make the list. The other morning, I was praying, doing listening prayer, sitting there, and then I had some big, heavy things on my heart. And I had just done this sermon, so I thought, well, I probably should practice this, right? <laughs> so I said, well, Lord, although I already know what you want to pray about because it's been heavy on my heart, I'll go through the motions here. No, I didn't do that. I said, Lord, you make the list. Something out of the blue, high priority in my life, but not on my heart and mind, not anywhere on my radar, was the thing that immediately came to my mind, became the top of the list. I got around, I prayed for the other things that were heavy on my heart. We we prayed for those. But it was interesting the way God had a different order in the list and a different item on the list that I didn't even plan. And I'll tell you, I prayed about that, spent some time, saw God do some very cool things in the course of the next couple days in that thing. And it was not even on my radar to pray for. So invite him to make the list. God, what what do we want to pray about today? What do you want to put on the list? And let him do that first. Number four, Simply ask his guidance. As you you put that list down, simply ask his guidance and jot things down as they come to you. This is an important part. This is learning. You're you're learning to discern his voice in prayer. As you're praying for these items, so you've got an agenda item that you believe God wants you to pray for. Simply ask him to lead, and then as things come to your mind, jot them down. You may find, I'm praying differently about this. As you start to pray some of your intentions, which is good, do that. But you might find that all of a sudden you get a check in your spirit and you're like, well, Lord, you don't want, that's not what you're doing? And just as things come to your mind, jot them down and begin to pray them. And then simply pray as he leads you. As those things start to form a direction, begin to pray those. And what you're finding is your prayer becomes interactive. It's not a monologue anymore. It's interactive. And it becomes alive. And I think you'll see God do some amazing things as you engage with him in prayer. See, one of the best ways to grow in listening is to engage your prayer partner, the Holy Spirit. I want to do an exercise here. I'm going to sing a song very simply and invite you to sing along. But you can really what I want you to do is I want you to think about an issue you're facing. Okay, we've got a few minutes here. 
Just think about an issue you're facing. And I want to, as we sing, as we pray, just in a reflective moment, invite him to lead you in prayer. Ask, Lord, how do you want me to pray for this issue? You might say, I know exactly how to pray. Let's put that on hold. Let's pretend we heard the last 30 minutes, okay? No, but seriously, ask him, Lord, how do you want me to pray for this thing? And in this, I want you to invite him to lead your thinking, to change your thinking if need be, and write things down as they come to mind. You can use your phone. You can use whatever. Pray for his will to be revealed and accomplished. Invite him to come and to speak. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that we would hear you. And I pray that we would be changed. You are good, and I trust you. Speak to us. He is so good. The Lord is good. Lord, you are good. I'm going to sing, but I just want to encourage you. Just let this be a time for you and the Lord. I want to be where you are. I want to know who you are. When you call my name, I'll say to you, here I am. I'm listening, Lord. Speak to me. I want to see how you see. Change my heart, Lord. Make me holy. If there's anything in my life that doesn't honor you today, I'm listening, Lord. Speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to me. I want to be where you are. I want to know who you are. And then I call. I'll say to you, here I am, Lord, I'm listening, Lord, speak to me, I want to see how you see, change my heart, Lord, make me holy, is anything in my life that doesn't speak let listen speak to me Lord speak to me speak to me
there's anything in my life that doesn't honor you today i am listening lord speak to me speak to me speak to me speak to me Let me hear your voice. Let me feel your heart. Let me see your hand, God, and follow you. Speak to me. No other name. I want to hear your voice. Is anything? doesn't honor you today i'm listening lord speak to me speak to me lord we invite you to speak i pray that these issues that we presented this morning that we would hear you and we would present ourselves as candidates for change, as much as the situation that we want to see changed. up father not just in this gathering not just in this place but in our prayer lives we invite you to lead by the holy spirit we invite you to take our prayer life to new places as we learn to listen and then we follow in obedience which is really the essence of discipleship we love you we praise you and we thank you in jesus name amen amen god bless you Thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Pastor Sean, for that, that amazing message. It hit, that's going to stay there. It hit home today. It, it really, um, I read um, Romans 7 to a friend of mine last night, and just going into Romans 8, seeing how that just transitions right into where he was and his prayer life and where God has him. Um, I'm, I'm about to send him this message right now, right after I step off stage. So um, I really hope that you guys just allow space this week that you allow um, the space for God to speak, that you can listen, and that you take that opportunity to really like hone in on what God wants you guys to do. Thank you guys again for being here. If it's your first time here, thanks for hanging out with us today. Um, we're so happy you're here. We have a gift for you right outside in the Welcome Center. We'd love to um, just get to know you better. Uh, we do have a membership class coming up this coming Wednesday. It's via Zoom, so make sure you can, you can come find out all you want to know about River City. There you go. It's right there. Um, and it's going to be, it's really good. It's just a really cool um, way to see what we're about here at River City. And you guys can find out if you want to be members or not. So you can sign up on, at reallife.org or our app with that. We also have re-engage coming up, re-engage orientation coming up next Sunday. So if you guys want your marriage to be strengthened, you can also sign up for that at reallife.org or through our app. If you want prayer for anything, we'd love to pray for you over here by this blue wall. We love you guys. Have a great week.